you spot a figure in the distance, a man covered in robes that conceal most of his body. He also seems to be floating just a few inches off the ground. As you approach, you notice a faint blue light glowing from underneath his hood. It's only then that you realize the creature before you is made of many thin, wiry tentacles bundled together into a humanoid form, robe and all. Welcome to Monster of the Week, I'm Josiah, aka Dungeon Dad, and today we are going to be talking about yet another monster on our spooky October list. We've already looked at an undead and a demon who was also sort of undead, so today we're going to be looking at something a little bit different. Something for those of you who like a little bit more psychological horror, or maybe some eldritch Cthulhu-esque inspired adventures. Today's monster is the Hashalak, colloquially known as the Dream Stealer. I imagine they threw that in there because Dream Stealer is a lot easier to say and remember than Hashalak. But I digress. Today's creature does not come from one of the source books, it actually comes from an edition of Dragon Magazine, issue 324 to be exact. This creature is pretty crazy and has a lot of really neat and unique abilities you won't find anywhere else, at least not in 5th edition. As I mentioned briefly, it is an eldritch inspired kind of monster and for those of you who run that kind of game or just want to do a session like that, maybe for Halloween, I definitely recommend trying to find a PDF copy of this issue of Dragon because there's a really great article in there called The Shadow Over D&D which is all about running a D&D &D game in that style. Anyways, back to the monster, today we're going to be talking about just what this creature can do in combat and out of combat some ways we can modify it to make it a little bit more suited to our needs, and of course some ways that you can actually use this creature in your game. The first thing I want to talk about today though is what this creature can actually do outside of combat. For one, when it comes to language, this thing doesn't really have a mouth, it only uses telepathy to communicate. And it can actually speak the language of any creature that it has contacted telepathically. So if you're in the vicinity of one of these things, it can contact you telepathically and instantly know any language you know. Furthering this theme of telepathic communication, it also has an ability called intimate knowledge. This trait allows the Hashalak to pick up on the emotional state and surface thoughts of any creature within 60 feet, meaning that it can tell if you're going to attack it because it can feel that aggressive emotion, or it can tell if you're interested in conversing or if you're not really much of a threat at the moment. It uses this information to capitalize on the emotions and surface thoughts of those around it, meaning that it can't be flanked in combat because it knows when you're coming at it, and it could take advantage of someone who might be on the brink of rage or on the brink of sorrow, whatever the case may be. Be. The other neat thing about this ability is it can narrow it down to focus entirely on just one creature. If it does this, it gains more intimate and focused knowledge of that one creature and therefore has advantage every time it makes an attack against them. Also, when that creature attacks the Hashalak, it does so with disadvantage. This is pretty useful in combat, but outside of combat, it also gives the creature an advantage on bluff checks. This is pretty useful in combat, but outside of combat, it has some other advantages too. It gives the Hashalak advantage on diplomacy checks, deception checks, checks and insight checks to gain information about that creature. The best part is there's no save or anything involved, it just does this. You might get the feeling that this thing knows a little bit more about you than it should, but at the end of the day there's nothing to tip off that it can actually read your emotional state. So in a non-combat scenario, this is a pretty cool ability. Now moving on to what this thing can actually do in battle, to start off I just want to mention it is CR5. So this creature is great for when you're just getting into that second tier of play. It's in that CR sweet spot where it's usable as a powerful enemy for a lower level group of players, but also usable as part of a group of enemies for a mid-level group of players. It's resistant to a lot of different damage types, but it is weak against Radiant, which is kind of cool, and that also ties in that whole Eldritch theme, and it does something that not many creatures in 5th edition do and that is ability damage. And the way it does this damage is very flavorful and pretty interesting in my opinion. Its only real melee ability is an attack called Euphoric Touch. When it uses this attack, it reaches out one of its appendages and touches the mind of a creature within melee range. Unlike many attacks that cause bodily harm or even ghostly attacks that cause necrotic damage, this attack causes the subject to experience emotions of intense pleasure and euphoria. So intense that it will break the mind of weaker willed creatures. Anyone, un anyone who is affected by this takes a d4 plus one wisdom damage. Because I know ability damage isn't very common in 5th edition, I'll explain how this works. When a creature takes ability damage, in this case wisdom damage, their ability score is lowered by that many points. So say a character who has 15 wisdom is hit by this attack. Their modifier on their wisdom score is plus two. If they take three wisdom damage, their wisdom score is now 12, meaning that their modifier goes down to plus one. 
This is something that's going to be really bad for certain characters and not as big a deal for others. For example, your monk is not going to want to take wisdom damage pretty much more than any other class. However, the barbarian doesn't really care too much if it takes wisdom damage, at least not at first. Because the issue with taking ability damage is if any of your ability scores, including wisdom, drop to zero or less, you die. Now, depending on which ability score it is, it's flavored in different ways, but in this instance, if a creature's wisdom score is brought to zero or less, their mind is effectively broken and they are unable to do anything, therefore they die. So where a barbarian might not care about its wisdom score even being in the negatives, because it has such a low wisdom score, it's not going to want to take that damage because if you only have eight or nine wisdom, then you have less points to lose. Granted, a d4 plus one wisdom damage isn't horrible, but it can be anywhere between two and five points of damage every turn. So once the players realize what's going on, they're going to want to be careful. Now, of course, there is a second part to this attack. When a creature takes damage from this attack, it has to make a wisdom save. If it fails that save, it now suffers from a condition called brain lock. This was something that I kind of had to homebrew a little bit here because brain lock does not exist in fifth edition. It was more of a psionic thing in third edition and psionics don't have a ton of support yet in 5e, so this is what it does. A creature who is brain locked essentially has all of the higher brain functions locked away. This means they can't talk, they can't cast spells, and they can't really think critically or make plans. However, that creature is not stunned. They're still able to make physical attacks and move around, they just do everything with disadvantage. So an effect like this is going to be horrible for a spellcaster. It basically takes them out of the fight for as long as they're brain locked. For a straight up melee fighter, it makes them a little bit weaker in the fact that they're rolling with disadvantage and they won't be able to use some of their class abilities depending on what class they are, but it doesn't outright take them out of the fight. This effect lasts for four rounds or until the creature who's affected can make their wisdom save. So at the beginning of every turn, the affected creature has to make a wisdom save to try to break out of that brain lock. This ability is not only useful for the hashlack in combat, but it gives a really good opportunity for an affected person to RP it a little bit. And anytime a player who likes to RP gets that option in combat, it always adds a little something extra to the battle. Now another, now moving on to the next ability here, the hashlack can also use something called Mind Probe. This was a psionic power in third edition, but because again, we don't have that support for psionics, I basically just converted it into an ability. Mind Probe is an action, and when the Hashalak uses Mind Probe, it can then invade the mind of one of the creatures that is under the effect of its intimate knowledge power. So anyone within 60 feet. This power lasts for six rounds, and during those six rounds, the beginning of each one, the Hashalak is able to ask the affected creature a question. Telepathically, of course. That creature gets to make a wisdom save. If they fail, they answer that question to the best of their ability. So meaning that over the course of a minute, the Hashalak can ask six questions and is potentially going to get six answers. If the creature makes its will save, it doesn't have to answer the question. So this ability isn't super useful in combat. Out of combat, it can be great. But in combat, it's going to be very situational and seldom ever useful. The only situation I can really think of where this might be powerful in a combat situation is if you have a Hashalak backing up a more powerful boss and the Hashalak uses this power to find out how the heroes are going to try to kill the boss and then it can tell its master what's going on. But other than that, it's more useful out of combat and good for story hooks, but we'll get more into that in a minute here. The last thing that this guy can do in battle is cast spells. It doesn't have a ton of spells, but each spell it has serves a purpose and is going to be very useful. First off, it can cast Mage Hand. Pretty simple, pretty basic, mostly used for utility things. Secondly, it can cast Mage Armor, which it's going to want to do at the beginning of almost every encounter just to up its AC a little bit. It can also cast Cure Wounds, which is always going to be useful to keep itself alive. And to kind of top it all off here, of course, because it's an Eldritch monster from beyond, it can cast Shape Change. Shape Change is useful in so many different ways. It can be good out of combat, so it can disguise itself as just a random townsperson navigating through the city without getting noticed. It can Shape Change itself into something powerful that can be useful in battle. And for the purposes of this spell, it's considered an 8th level caster, meaning that it can turn into things like a T-Rex, or even a young red dragon, or even something like a Medusa to try to stone one of the creatures before turning back and using its other abilities. Shape change is really as useful as you want to make it as a DM, and the fact that it has that option is just great. The last spell it has, which again is more of an out of combat thing though, 
is Dream. If you're not familiar with Dream, it's a pretty nifty spell. Basically, it allows you to invade the dream of another creature and portray a message to them using symbols and a limited amount of words. This is good for conveying messages to other creatures that might be a million miles away. However, you also have the option of making the dream a nightmare. And when you do that, any creature who is affected by it is robbed of their good night's rest, and when they wake up, they take a certain amount of psychic damage. So obviously there are some story applications you could use this for. However, I just want to quickly talk about using this in combat. It can only be used on a sleeping target, so in the heat of battle, this is literally useless. However, this spell makes the Hashalak a lethal nighttime ambusher. Even for a higher level party, if you have two or three of these guys ambush them in the night, it can be a real mess. Just imagine this. Party's had a long day of battle and travel, and they're ready to rest up for the night. The sorcerer is pretty much out of spells, and everyone's a little bit beat up. So they're all looking forward to getting back those hit points, getting back those sorcery points, spells, abilities, all that stuff. It's the long rest, first one they've had in a while. The Hashalak is able to sneak up on them. It's proficient in stealth checks, and if its shape changes into something innocuous like a snake slithering through the grass or a bird flying overhead, it most likely won't get noticed. Using its innate knowledge ability, it can then figure out who and what everyone is within the party, even if it has to study them for a couple minutes. Using its mind probe ability, it can then probe the mind of the party members and ask them questions that it will automatically get the answer to because they're sleeping and unable to resist. It can then cast the dream spell on the sorcerer. The sorcerer has a terrible nightmare of who knows what. Something relevant to the story hopefully, but whatever the case is, it's bad. He bolts up right in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. He takes 3d6 psychic damage and he's deprived of his long rest, meaning that he doesn't get those spells back and he's a little bit worse for wear now. So now the party's on high alert, one of them is much weaker, the enemy potentially has debilitating information about what their plans are, and that's when it starts things off by reverting to its form and using its euphoric touch ability on the fighter. That is not an easy encounter, but it's definitely a memorable one. Alternatively, it might not even attack in the night. Maybe it simply just sneaks up and uses its mind probe ability to gather information and then leaves. Each player who's had their mind invaded wakes up knowing something's wrong, remembering a strange voice asking them questions, but ultimately isn't much worse for wear. These are just a couple ideas of how this creature might operate considering its abilities. And this brings us on to our final part of the video where I want to talk about some plot hooks and how you might use this creature in your game. To start off here, I'd like to talk about the origins of just what this creature actually is. This creature is part of the Quarry, which is a group of evil extraplanar entities from the Eberron setting. Basically their whole deal is that they're from a plane of dreams. There are several of these dream quarry creatures that kind of inhabit this other world, and they can come to our world by infesting themselves in willing hosts. Now whether or not you want to read up on that and actually use that in your campaign, that's totally up to you, but it just kind of gives us this idea of what they are. So you could definitely have a creature who is possessed by a Hashalak. Maybe a leader of a cult to one of the great old ones actually ends up being a vessel for for this creature. Or, speaking of the great old ones, maybe this creature acts as kind of a liaison between a warlock and its entity that it's made a pact with. Given its dream abilities, this is very flavorful and possibly a great way to convey information from your warlock's patron to them, supposing they've taken that pact. And maybe if your warlock does something that goes against the will of its patron, instead of being communicated with through a regular dream, they have a nightmare. This creature also makes a great denizen of the it was all a dream adventure. Maybe you're doing a non-canon one-shot for your Halloween game, or maybe you're having a canon game that actually is just the creatures going into a dream. Whatever the case is, that's what these guys were originally designed for. Given all of their other abilities, they can make a really flavorful encounter for a dream adventure. You could also decide that perhaps there's a Hashalak who isn't necessarily evil in your game. They're very intelligent and lore-wise have been traditionally kind of history keepers and arcanists. In the D&D canon, they're kind of more the lore keepers of their species. So maybe there's some distant plane with a library on it and this guy is acting as one of the lore keepers in there. Probably the most horrifying librarian ever. Or maybe he's trying to gather information from the material plane and has possessed the librarian of some great archive. Or of course you could run this creature as a solo operative. Maybe it's trying to find its way back to its original plane. Or maybe seeing how much stronger it is than the denizens of the material plane, it's decided to set itself up in a powerful position. Whatever you end up going Going with lore wise, these creatures are quite strange and make a great addition to a Cthulhu mythos inspired campaign. Anyways, that is all for today. Hopefully you enjoyed listening to me talk about these technically not so technical beasts. And if you do like what I do here, please consider subscribing to the channel. I've got at least one new video every week. And of course, if you check the description below, we've got a discord server now. We've got lots of great conversation happening there. 
Uh, there is a subreddit set up where I have an archive of all the monsters I've covered thus far, as well as some other topics and things. And if you don't use those sites and you still want to stay connected, we've of course got a Facebook link. And as always, you can find me on Twitter. I'm pretty much constantly posting there just about what's going on in my D&D world from day to day. And if you really want to go above and beyond to support the channel, I do have a Patreon set up now also. You can find a link to that in the description below too. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And as always, I will see you next week.